are. They are. They that's, okay. Than that. that's okay. <laughs> well, let us let us uh, join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day. We thank you for beauty. For that gives testimony to you. We thank you that you've created us that we may enjoy beauty. Because you are beauty and truth. And we know that you have created us to glorify you and to enjoy you forever. We thank you. Help us live into that gracious calling now and in the life to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we are... Moving along in Acts, and it's really mostly some narrative to cover today. Uh, it's a book called Acts, so it shouldn't surprise us that there's a lot of acts um, to, to, to cover. Um, so so let's, let's dive into this uh, part of the narrative where Paul is in Jerusalem. And uh, just by way of reminder, I opened with the question to, to remind ourselves, uh, uh, they, they are preparing to go to Rome, right? Uh, but in Acts 21, 15, they are making ready to go where? To Jerusalem. Right. And, right. And which direction do you go to Jerusalem? Go up. To. You go up. You always go up. <laughs> we got to pray again. Yes, you do. <laughs> Yay. I'm so glad to see you. Yeah. Glad to see you. I missed you last week. Yes, we. Uh, yes, I went we to Blue Ridge and relaxed. Oh, how nice! It's good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's about it. <laughs> First and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the warmth outside. We thank you for the people gathered in this room and the people that's gathered on the Zoom. Thank you for that rhyme that I did not know was coming. Lord, we thank you for the your word that you've given us to study because we know that once we get closer to your word, we get closer to you because in the beginning was the word and the word was you and the word was with you. So we ask that you let that word be with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Sorry. Uh, um, so, so yes. So in Acts 21, 15, uh, uh, Paul and his entourage are preparing to go up to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem, even if you start from the North Pole, up to Jerusalem, to the holy city, to the Mount of our Lord. What pronouns in that verse remind us of who is in the entourage? We, so Thanks. Luke's there. Right, exactly. We, this is the beginning, uh, this is a continuation, excuse me, of, of a we passage in Acts, and that reminds us that the author, traditionally we believe this is Luke, the, the physician, uh, is with Paul. At the very least, the writer has a primary source there. Um, uh, yeah, but but it makes sense. Um, we said he, he, uh, he initially uh, joined them uh, back before they, when they get the word not, not to go into uh, Asia, but to go to Macedonia. And then he drops out at Philippi where there was a big medical facility. And then he rejoins the group at, when they come back through Philippi. And he's still with them as Paul is going to Jerusalem. So uh, in Acts 21, 17, somebody read that for us. And, um, and thinking about how do the leaders of Jerusalem uh, greet this, this party of Paul's? May, may I ask one question first? Sure. Backing sure. up to... Uh, it's right before our stop today, but 21, um, five, the second part, third part of it, it said all the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city. Mm -hmm. Would these just have meant the people of the church there? Not correct. Because the, the 12 didn't take wives and children 
I never talked about having right. lost and, children. And, and from here on, you'll never hear the original 12, or I should say the original 11 plus one. Mm -hmm. They will never be called the disciples again. They will be called the apostles. I got you. So you and I are disciples, right? Right. Of all of all denominations, we should know that, right? Yep. So this means the the believers in that area. Good question. Good question. <clears throat> so excuse me. So now twenty one seventeen. Somebody read that for us. And how are they greeted? Then Paul came out of the uh, centurions and said. Take the young man. Oh, no, 21, 21, 17. I just saw extras. 21, okay, 17. <clears throat> Let's hope there's no words in here I can't say. <laughs> nah. Oh, please. <clears throat> Somebody else got it quickly. Okay. You got okay. it. Okay, sorry. Take your time. Go ahead. Yeah. Now I found it. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Thank you. That's it. That's all we got. Um, so what was their reception? Yeah. Warm. 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 Anybody have any different words? Yeah, okay. Warmly. Warmly. Gladly in the RSV. Anybody? I feel like you were saying yeah. brothers, mine added sisters. Yeah, I have brothers and sisters. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, I just got brothers. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, later, uh, some of the late 20th century translations go for inclusive language. So they'll put in ancestors where it originally just said brethren. And I'm sure all the elders were only men. Mm. It says and all the elders. We don't know that. I mean, I'm gonna put, we don't know that. That's a common assumption. Yeah. Um, but we don't know that because... Prisca and Aquila, right? Mm -hmm. Prisca yeah. is always listed first, right? So, so um, got it, right? Um, in fact, that would be an that would be something to push back against if somebody says, "Well, all the leaders of the early church were men." It says so, elders. Well, I don't know about you, but I know women who are elders, who are elder, who are older, mm -hmm. who are lead. You know, I mean, it, yeah. that's a not a gender based term, yeah. right? So, yeah, yeah, it's definitely not gender based. Yeah. So, but then, but then something happens. The tone changes on day two. Um, and a concern is raised um, by, by some of the Jerusalem leadership. What concern do they raise? Um, they um, start talking about the problem that when they're talking to the Gentiles, they kind of have turned away from the teaching of Moses. And of course, the problem of circumcising their children and um, customs and things. So they yeah. start talking about the nitty gritties. He says they're zealous for the law. Yeah. And and is look especially at verse twenty one. He, he they say he's teaching the he heard they he was teaching the Jews not to circumcise exactly yeah, yeah. They, they're not concerned about Gentiles being told you don't have to follow the law right because there's but they're concerned that that they're getting reports that Jews are being told oh no 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 that's not important sure, that's not important. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Have we gotten that sense from Paul that he's been telling Jews not to mm -mm. just the law? Yeah, right. So, so, so they're getting this. What we know as a reader, oh, almost oh excellent Theophilus, which we know as a reader is not correct, right? And, um, but they they ask Paul to do something for PR purposes, basically. Um, look at verses twenty three and twenty. Or what do they, somebody read that for us. What does he ask them to, to Paul to do? So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. So, so it's, it's a PR stunt, basically, he's being asked to do. 
right? Um, have have we seen um, Paul do something like this before? Let's look back, um, read Acts chapter 16, one through three. Somebody read that for us. Paul went on to Derby and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with them, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. Thank you. So, so see what's going on here, right? You're Jewish if your mother was Jewish, okay. right? Um, and, and so he is Jewish ethnically, but everybody knows his dad was a Greek. So probably he wasn't circumcised, right? So Paul, Paul deliberately takes him and has him circumcised, right? Because of the Jews, right? It says explicitly there, um, because of the Jews that were in those places. Say that again. Hopefully with his permission. Yeah, really. Yeah. I was well, gonna ask, what the anesthesia look like? Have a have a swig. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. And there are there are some natural local anesthetics, mm. but not no. No. Oh. no. This was a big deal. Yeah. A big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um and uh, Timothy really wanted to go on this missionary trip, in other words. Right. You got to you know? really want to go, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, hey. So Paul Paul has already shown that he's he's perfectly willing to be deferential to people's scruples about the law, to mm -hmm. Jewish scruples about complying with the law. He's never said, he's never tried to, to lure Jews away from from living into their Jewishness, right? Now, even so, is there something in this exchange in Acts 21 that's a little bit surprising? Somebody read Acts 21, verse 25. With regard to the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. With, re with regard to the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from what is strangled and from sexual immorality. Thank you. Does we, anything we, about we that? talked about that before. Yeah. Look over in chapter 15. Chapter 15 <laughs> tells the story of, uh, of what event, what really huge event in the life of the church. The Jerusalem Council. Exactly. Which is the first ecumenical council. Ecumen ecumenical means the whole household from, from the Greek oikonomos, from which we get the word economy, household economics, right? So the first ecumenical council, the whole household comes together. And the question was, what do we do with the Gentiles? Do they have to follow the law? And so there's this whole exchange. Paul is supposedly there with Barnabas and there's an exchange and, and James gets up after everybody's had their say. And, and, and he says in verse 19, uh, Acts 15, verse 19, therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the pollutions of idols and from unchastity and from what is strangled and from blood. Okay. And then they're good, right? He says we're gonna we're gonna write to them. And then who takes the letter? Paul oh, and some other people. Right. <laughs> right. Verse 22, it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from them, 
from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Oh my, oh, back in 21. Yeah, back in chapter, yeah, back in chapter 15, verse 22. 15, right, right. So the, the, the upshot of the Jerusalem council, right, is this decision. And they're going to write a letter. They're sending it to, to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas and some other people. And we even have the content of the letter in verses 23 and following. And there it is down in verse 28, uh, 29, abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, from unchastity. And we show that that's straight out of Leviticus. Paul carried a letter that says that. So I said back in chapter 15, there's just no jiving what goes on here with other passages from Paul and even now another passage from Acts. If Paul was there, why do they think they have to tell him? I mean, surely they're not that stupid, right? Mm, they may be maybe getting mixed messages. But they sent him out with a letter. True. They sent him out with a letter. It's as though they're telling him for the first time about the letter. Something here just doesn't jive. And good luck making sense of it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of ink has been spilled on a lot of paper trying to explain <laughs> this away. And the bottom line is it just, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. What, that he had a letter first? I mean, if he had the letter, why do they have to tell him about the letter? So where do they tell him about the letter? So they tell him. All this went kind of fast. Assume, it, sure. I've seen people say they weren't, they weren't telling Paul. They were just saying, look, this is what we're going to say to the Jews that are about to go crazy here in Jerusalem. You, you know, you, you and the your fellow Jewish people are going to go to the temple and, you know, comply with the law. And then as for the Gentiles, or as you know, and as we can tell these Jews, you know, we've told them blah, blah, blah. So in other words, you're just saying nobody's telling anybody to completely disregard the law. That's not my view. I'm just saying. Right. Yeah. Maybe that's what somebody says. So, so what we're saying, Cedric, in verse, in chapter 21, mm -hmm. Verse 25, they tell Paul, we've sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from all this stuff. Reading container, yep, do this, do this. But back in 15, they handed him that letter and said, go take it to them. Mm. Oh, how does he, what makes them think he doesn't know about the letter, right? It just doesn't jive. Or maybe they're being sarcastic. Well, I don't know. Nah. But I actually do think what I just said it's really more the intent of the passage. They're just saying, this is what we'll be able to say now to the Jews here in Jerusalem about whether you, we, anybody's telling anybody just completely disregard the Mosaic law. I'm, I'm glad that works for you. <laughs> <laughs> because to me, if that was the intent, they would say, we're going to show them a copy of the letter. Mm -hmm. it, it would have talked about the interaction with those Jews. Where's the 15? It, it in 15, comes, where's the letter? In 15. You said 22. In chapter 15, the letter appears, the intent to write the letter is in verse 19, uh, excuse me, 20. Write to them, blah, blah. And then mm -hmm. in 22, they say they're going to send it with these people. And then in 23 and following, they actually give us the content of the letter. <laughs> to be continued. So, yeah. So good luck figuring out. It's one of the questions I have when I get up to heaven. I'm going to say, excuse me, Luke. <laughs> Luke, you're a smart writer. What, what was this? What happened here? What happened here? Right. Okay. And I, maybe he'll have some very simple explanation and I'll go. Okay. But uh, in any event, despite Paul's gesture of good faith, what happens in verses 27 to 36? I had a typo there. In 27 to 36, what happens? Right. Oh, yeah. You got it. Yep. And it's all it's all based on 
we'll be kind and say misunderstandings uh, uh, is jumping to the worst conclusions. In verse 29, it says they had seen him previously with Trophimus, the Ephesian, who was clearly a Gentile, that's a Gentile name. And they supposed that Paul had brought him in the temple, right? which was a no-no, mm -hmm. right? There was a big sign. Uh, there was an outer court for the Gentiles, an inner court for the Jews, an, an, an even more inner court for Jewish men. And then the innermost court was the Holy of Holies, only for the high priest, only on Yom Kippur. And there was actually a sign between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the Jews that said, if you're Gentile and you cross this line, your life is forfeit. And the Romans let them get away with it. The Romans let them say that, which mm -hmm. is pretty uncharacteristic of the Romans. Um, they reserved the, uh, the power of capital punishment unto themselves pretty um, strictly. But they've, they're assuming that Paul took Trophimus into that inner portion, the, the Jewish portion of the temple. And so, so there's this riot, right? despite the appeasement effort. Um, Jews of the 20th century would be very quick to say that appeasement has never worked for Jews. Um, uh, in this case, in that case for Jews living in Europe, and in this case, a, a Jewish Christian in Jerusalem. So he gets arrested, he gets dragged away by soldiers and the mob shouting away with him, right? But characteristically, Paul seizes the moment to do what? What's, what's Paul's default response to any to an arrest, to a persecution, to an argument, to a riot? He will always take it as a chance to preach the word. Preach. <laughs> and That's, say, hey, buddy, I'm really a Roman. You can't do this. So, me. well, he doesn't get to that quite yet, right? Mm -hmm. Right? In verse three. Oh, this is uh, second play. Yeah, exactly. In verse three, it's, I'm a Jew. Born at Tarsus. Brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Educated according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. Being zealous for God as you all are this day. What a politician, right? And remember, we met Gamaliel once before in Acts. Do you remember when we, we met Gamaliel? Ooh. Or Gamaliel, depending on. <laughs> remember after Paul, after, excuse me, Peter is arrested um, and there's a big debate within the Sanhedrin, within the leadership, what should we do about, um, about these Christians and Gamaliel counsels? Nothing. Do nothing. If this, uh, you know, we've seen this before. We've seen Messianic pretenders and they, the Messianic pretender goes away and the movement goes away. So that's what's going to happen. We've killed their leader. Don't worry about it. You don't want to inflame things. Not only that, if this movement is of God, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Mm. Right. So we have met Gamaliel before, and we know about Gamaliel from non-biblical sources, highly respected rabbi at that time. So Paul's putting out his credentials, and then he is telling his story. He's proclaiming the word, and he dwells in his little sermon there in, um, it runs from Acts 21 uh, over into uh, 22. Um, what what does he what does he really dwell on as a personal incident? He starts up actually in chapter twenty two verse six. He dwells on a personal incident. What is it? The, the road to Damascus. Yes, yes, his personal encounter with Jesus. Um, and how many times now have we heard this story told? Twice. Twice now, right? We've already heard the story. Why does Luke have actually have Paul iterated again? Why not just say, and Paul told about the story at Damascus, on the road to Damascus. Why actually iterate it again? Because the longer you, you know, the longer you go, the more important it gets. Like the more important your testimony gets. Like it's Yeah. Just, I don't know, it just yeah. feels I don't know, it just feels deeper the more times God delivers you from things you 
you have to remember the beginning of it. Yeah. So it's important. He's he's making a statement about how important this remains to Paul, mm -hmm. right? Very good. What is he saying about personal testimony's role in proclamation? That it's really important. Yeah, important. It, it, it's necessary to exactly to say yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not enough to stand up there and say Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ has come again. When you give witness, you've got to say, and in my life, blah, 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 right? So that's what people really care about is, is it matters to somebody personally, right? Okay, as long as we're on oopses, mm -hmm. um, notice here in Acts 22, Paul, in verse six, there's a light. And then, and then a voice, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I'll lapse into the K, that beautiful KJV rendering, right? Mm -hmm. And then in verse nine, now those who were with me, what does it say? They saw the, saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. Yours says understand. Anybody have a different, a more literal translation? I can hear. Yes, correct. They did not hear the voice. Yeah, that your translation's trying to do a little wiggle in there. Mm. <laughs> a little wiggling. Say that again. Harmonizing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if you look over in chapter nine, verse seven, somebody read chapter nine, verse seven. No. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Heard the sound, but did not see anyone. But what happened in chapter 22? Says they didn't hear. Yeah, they saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. Yeah. Yeah, but they didn't understand. Yeah, right, 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 right. We're gonna wiggle a little and make it understand. See? That's why you oh. say understand. So so um good luck. <laughs> good luck. It was just the sound of wind. Um they they yeah. Um these don't jive. They just don't. And what should that tell us about the importance of little details like that? Are they? Yeah, are they that important? Are they that important? <laughs> right. Are they that important? Luke's a smart guy. He is he's not unaware that one account says one thing and one account says another. And he's clearly not bothered by it. Um, and we shouldn't be either. And there are going to be other times where you see things like that. Just, don't you, let it don't let it fret I think you. You're the only one who sees it. No, I'm not. You're not. Okay. Trust me. Because I have not ever experienced Be anyone digging into this thing like this. Because trust me, people use this to say the Bible isn't it could, true. It contradict, yeah. Um, and and it's also something that commentators commonly deal with. And that translator dealt with it. <laughs> right? Because he said the word literally is here, but I don't like that because that doesn't jive with nine. So I'm going to make it understand. All translations are an interpretive leap. I like I like translations that that. But he had studied that. chapter nine, and he knew that they heard, but they didn't understand. I know they didn't. So it all works out together in the big picture. As long as that works for you. Okay. And I'm not going to do my PhD study on this. <laughs> <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> makes two of us. Now, now, uh, back in chapter 22, in verses 22 to, to uh, 29, uh, the Roman authorities realized that they did a big oops. What big oops do they realize they, they committed? Well, they... They put Paul in chains and they were about to beat him. And then Paul asked, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Oops. Oops. 
Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> big, big no, no. They denied a Roman citizen due process. Um, and and when he claims to be a Roman citizen, um, um uh, word reaches the tribune. He's, he says he's a Roman citizen and the tribune comes and asks him. And what does the tribune say to him in verse 28? And how does Paul want to up him in 29? The tribune said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. Yeah. But Paul said that he was born. He was that born as his citizen. citizen. Yeah. What they say in yeah. Atlanta, you flew here. <laughs> I grew here. <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's one up in him. He's one up in the guy. Does this remind you of what he did back at the beginning of chapter 22, verse 3? Uh huh. <laughs> what did what he do there? I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia that brought up but brought up in this city anyway he studied yeah he, yeah yeah i was I, listen i got my phd under gamaliel yeah don't talk to me about the law don't talk to me about being strict to the law and then yeah false modesty is not one of this man's vices right <laughs> right right and and he is divinely equipped to be able to answer these kinds of situations and he tells how wrong he was i persecuted this way yeah to yeah. death arresting and putting both men and women in jail as both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. Like, ask the people. Yeah, yeah. I was a gangster and God saved me. <laughs> Although to them, he wasn't a gangster, right? Right. Right. right? I was one of you. Mm -hmm. One of you. Yeah. Um, how does that irony? Well, oh, we, oh, we already talked about that. So um, how did the events in this in this section echo Christ's passion. Where, where, where do you see some similarities to Jesus' trial? Well, Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin. Yep. Yep. So, so similarly, does, does, Jesus, does Jesus, Jesus' trial start with a Roman accusation or an accusation by Jewish leadership? leadership. Jewish leadership. And same here with Paul. And he's brought, both of them are brought before the Sanhedrin. And then they are turned over to the Romans, Romans right? And what happened to Jesus when he was turned over to the Romans? The first thing that happened to him. You saw the past, the, 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 the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ. It's one of the well, he tried to, most brutal scenes in, in, yeah. in movie history. But then after that, they turned him back and said, well, you deal with them, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of passing around. But once the Romans have hold of him, before they crucify him, they scourge him. They scourge him. Exactly, Diane. Exactly. They whip him. They scourge him. And and Luke is really sharp with his um uh, his narrative development here, right? He's been really building you up. This is just like Jesus, just like Jesus, just like Jesus. And now he's about to be examined by scourging, right? That's interview by torture, right? And so you're ready for things to go in a certain direction, but that's not what happens. There's this, oh, whoa, wow. Um, there is another similarity. Um, what specific person does he come up against? In Acts 23, verse 2. The high Ananias. priest. Right. The high priest, Ananias. Right. And who was the high priest that oversaw Jesus' trial? Don't think too hard. Nice. Ananias. Yeah. Yeah. Of the, fa of the family of Caiaphas. Yep. Yeah. Done it again. Yep. Uh, a, yep. A question, and I yes. may have missed it. How is Paul Roman? He was born a Roman citizen. So, so you don't have to be born in Rome to be Roman. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, remember that um, when you think about the Roman Empire, think about the mafia. Very much so. That's a really good model to use. And so you are a member of a particular mafia family, familia, not because of where you live, but because of your tie to the family. You can live in Sicily. You can live in the Bronx. You can live in Chicago or Atlanta. Yeah, you're still. Right? You're still part of the familia. Familia. And there are other people who live in those places who are not part of the familia. Paul was a member of the familia. Clearly, his father had also been a Roman citizen. And notice that the tribune says, I bought my citizenship. You could buy your citizenship. You could also be awarded citizenship because of service to the empire. A lot of Roman soldiers, when they retired, they were granted citizenship and a piece of land. Right. And a mule. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, and yeah, and that's the other thing is you you are a slave to the head of the house. They have absolute power over your you life and death for your whole lifespan. They have power of life and death over you. Um, so so he was born a Roman citizen in this sort of mafioso system you know, where the the emperor is the the ultimate pater familia. Okay. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Not going to argue with them. So, we are we are really being invited to see that this is a passion, like Jesus's passion, with a with a twist thrown in, a narrative twist that now it's a Roman citizen. He's not going to end up on a cross in Jerusalem. So, so O Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus. If you have never read this story before, you do not know the story, what effect does that have on your, um, your engagement with the story? Do you go, yeah, I know how this is gonna come out. Well, I would say he did this on purpose. He who? Paul. Paul was told not to go. He was told by the, the people that were prophesying what was going to happen to him. Mm -hmm. But he decided to go anyway. Mm -hmm. And so it's all his own fault. Uh, it's his choosing. Um, did uh, He's just a troublemaker. Uh, was Jesus warned not to go back to Jerusalem? Yes, he was. He right. was a troublemaker, too. Yep. 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 Was, yep. What, what do they call it? Good trouble? Trouble. Good trouble. Um, yeah, he, he feels called to go, so he goes. And he had felt the call to go to Rome. Um, but things aren't working out the way Paul thought he would it would work out at this point, right? He didn't think he was going to get arrested in Jerusalem. He thought he was going to hand over the, the collection, although Luke doesn't talk about the collection, right? But Paul does. And then he was going to go to Rome. So that's not working out the way he thought it would. But if you are the reader, as the reader, oh, most excellent Theophilus, put yourself in Theophilus's shoes. You've never read this before, mm -hmm. but you did read Acts. I mean, you did read Luke. You've been getting ready. Oh, this is looking like the same thing that happened to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Then there's a plot twist. There you go. There you go. So now, do you know how the story is going to come out? No. no. No, you don't. You don't. This is really cool literary craft. Yeah, it's literature. He's really hooking you in. Wow, this is a weird twist. This guy's a Roman citizen. How's this going to work out? Well, of course he's going to. Yeah, okay. This is all going to be okay. But then he's not all okay, right? Right? You don't know where things are going at this point. It's really great literature. And, and we lose, we're sort of inoculated against it, right? Because we've been exposed to the story so much, so much 
that we we lose that sense of of reader excitement. Yeah. Yeah. But this is really getting groovy here. And it's this is this is now an accurate action adventure novel very quickly, <laughs> right? 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 It's almost like a procedural. You can hear the boink boink in law and order, right? <laughs> boom, boom. Right? Right? Well, the, this this has been thrown out because the police didn't execute the warrant correctly. Well, whoa, he's a Roman citizen. Oh, okay. So now what are we going to do? It's really groovy, groovy narrative craft. Okay. Now, how does this passage here? Um, uh, we're we're in this this procedural phase now. We're in the in the court, um, and Paul. In Acts 22, verses three through five, he's a troublemaker, mm -hmm. right? Somebody read that, three through five in chapter 23. <clears throat> Is it 22 or 23? 23, chapter 23, verses three through five. <clears throat> then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you and, sorry. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You are sitting there judging me according to the law and yet in violation of the law, you are ordering me to be struck. Those standing nearby said, do you dare revile God's high priest? I did not know brothers that he was the high priest, replied Paul. For it is written, you must not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Thank you. So, so how does Paul here, this is really ironic, show deference for the law, even as he calls out someone who's hypocritical? Mm. He's like, I didn't know. Right. I didn't know. I would have probably said it differently. Yeah. And I he, still would have said it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And what does he what does he quote? He himself quotes. Um, Does he quote he the law of yeah, 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 yeah. He, he quotes say what exactly? Yeah, yeah. He quotes he quotes the law. Um, it's actually it's, it's from written. Exodus. It's from Exodus twenty two twenty eight. Yeah, written, yeah. So 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 here's this you know this really lovely ironic turn. They're accusing him of not honoring the law, and yet he quotes it. And oops, my bad. Sorry, I didn't mean to do. Didn't mean to break the law. But you're still a hypocrite, but you know, right. right? So, yeah. So he's threading that needle there. Then, then Paul gets wily on them. What does he do? In uh, somebody read for us, uh, chapter twenty-three, verse six. Six. Mm -hmm. Then Paul knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, called out to the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee mm -hmm. and the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. Oh boy. Oh dear. Oh boy. <laughs> There he is being a troublemaker. So he looks out in that crowd and he recognizes a two-party system. Mm -hmm. And he's a member of one of those parties. And one of those parties, the Pharisees, believes in the resurrection of the dead and the Sadducees do not. Oh my goodness. He is a sly dog, isn't he? Yep, he's trouble. Yep. And so, and so the whole thing devolves into this argument between the Sadducees and the Pharisees there, right? And the Pharisees, of course, are going to stick up for him. We find nothing wrong in this man. Yep. Right? What, what, if, what if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? The Sadducees don't believe in angels or spirits either, right? Uh -huh. right? And, then, and then it all gets violent. There's another, there's another. Another fist fight. This is I see this like as a scene from some madcap silent film, you know, with lots of, you know, gesticulating and and bobbies with the little hats and their little clubs. And it's just yeah, it just all fell apart, right? And they have to break the fight up. <laughs> does that does it remind you of anybody else you've met in Luke Atts? 
Who's that wily with his opponents? Jesus. Coyote. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Um, uh, when you have time, go back to Luke 20. Um, uh, Jesus is in this temple. And uh, well, we'll do it super, super fast. In uh, Luke 20, Ju uh, Jesus is in the temple, just like Paul has been uh, hauled out because of behavior in the temple. Um, and uh, in verses 19, he uh, he beats out the uh, the the chief priests trying to lay hands on him because they ask, do we owe taxes to Caesar or not? And he says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's, which is a pretty sly answer, but even more sly than that was his question. Well, show me a, show me a coin. And they pull out a Roman coin and they're inside the Jewish temple and they're not supposed to have Roman coins. Right. And then the Sadducees come to him and they ask that silly question about the woman who's this essentially a black widow. Her husbands keep dying, right? And and Jesus says, "Y'all don't even know what you're talking about." You know, this this the the and he, and he beats them on their own turf mm -hmm. because they only accept the Pentateuch. He goes on in verse thirty-seven, but that the dead are raised. Even Moses showed in the passage about the bush because God says, "I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob." And he's not the God of the dead. So clearly those people are alive. alive, right? So yeah, he turns the tables on them. They thought they were going to get him. And instead he got them. Um, how does this passage close? Verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem. So you must also testify in Rome. Thank you. Is there any irony here? Take courage. Things in Rome are just going to be just like here. <laughs> oh, right, right. No, yeah. Most of us would would say that the thing to say was, um, "Sorry to tell you, but <laughs> it's going to be the same when you get to Rome." Yeah. Jesus says, "Take courage. Be encouraged." Be and that was Paul. Paul loved a good fight. He did. Yeah. Right. We, we, we hear about him staying places because he had opposition, right? He loves a good fight. Um, so, so now, now we know uh, he is going to go to Rome. What's it going to look like? In chains. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and are we going to go straight to Rome? Hmm. Maybe hmm. not. The story unfolds before us. Um, Next week, we're going to take a break. I'll, I'm going to send you an amended schedule. I will be out of town. We're going to take a break. So we'll push we'll push everything back a week. Um, you're encouraged to visit one of our other wonderful classes, the fellowship class or the lectionary class. Um, and then we will reconvene two weeks from today. And I'm doing my presentation. You're still on the, do you want to, you still on that day? Yeah, I'm going to be That's out of town May 5th. That's totally so, fine. Yeah. Oh, cool. All righty. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you. Serve the Lord.